relations and geopolitics. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Venki Narayana Murthy, who is uh, a professor of physics, uh, Benjamin Pierce Professor of Technology and Public Policy at Harvard University. Um, Venki, welcome to theCUBE. Physics at Harvard? <laughs> now you founded the engineering yes. group at, uh, at Harvard, right? Uh, yes. Tell us about that. That's, uh, well, I, I'm actually uh, passionate about technology and the role of technology in the wider world. Technology is very much a techno-social system interacting with society. Harvard needed to have a strong presence in technology because of that very reason. Because I actually view liberal arts education as a very good thing, the breadth, but in fact the liberal arts education must change with the times. And in today's time where technology is about 80%, every one of us has a smartphone, president goes with his Blackberry and so on, that we need to have all Harvard students appreciate technology and all engineering students to appreciate the wider world. But that I said, we like to train engineers who not only know how things work, but how the world works. Well, and that's the difference in Harvard and, and some other technology. Well, well, you know, the tagline of Silicon Angle is uh, where computer science meets social science. Right. So, uh, so that's, I created a center for computation and society at Harvard as dean because we decided the computer science at Harvard would be different. Mm -hmm. In fact, it should relate to society right from the start. The well, we were talking off camera about the the impact that has on on invention. Yes, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Your perspectives on that. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, one of the things which we want to think about is really uh, all disciplines have creativity. So you're creative in various ways in journalism and other features. I might be in physics. Somebody else might be in social science. Invention is also a creative process, but which has value in terms of patents or something. And innovation is when it becomes applicable to the wider world. So we want to actually have a culture which embraces all three. And it can be, people talk about discovery, scientific discovery, but it turns out that scientific discovery and invention of new technologies are intimately related. Sometimes it's the invention which leads to new discoveries, sometimes discoveries lead to new inventions. And you need to have this interplay between discovery and invention. So that's sort of my mantra. And people leave out the word invention. For me, the greatest hero was Edison and Graham Bell. I work for Bell Labs. And Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone because his mother was deaf and his wife was deaf. He wanted to convert electricity into sound. What nicer thing to do about communication. So. We want to encourage the inventors. How about the Wright brothers? Where do they stand? <laughs> they, they are great. You right, know, they, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you want to try and experiment. They don't normally follow the rules. With no resources. <laughs> right, right. And cyber, in some senses, the computer scientists, the nerds, the electrical engineers, they designed a beautiful system to actually where people can communicate and, and in an open way, in a trustworthy way. And that's what led to this very worldwide so let's talk about your uh, your activities here today. Uh, you you hosted a panel. You gave some brief remarks. Uh, yeah. Then Fa uh, Fadi Shahadi, the the CEO of uh, Vicon, uh, gave a great presentation. And then you had uh, Michelle Markoff and and Lynn Saint Amour. Michelle yeah. is the yeah. senior policy advisor, yeah. office of coordinator cyber affairs at the State Department. She's leaving. Yeah. Full disclosure there. And Lynn Saint Amour is uh, the CEO of uh, of ISOC, which was started by Ben Serif and, and other Digirati. So. Um, so that was a very interesting session. We, we heard uh, from the president and CEO of, of ICON, Fadi Shahadi, that essentially the current structure is not sustainable, uh, which was sort of new news. Yes, so, so I think this is uh, kind of important. The internet started in the United States. And if you look at how each, each one of you, if you know how computers work, the computer scientists and the electrical engineers have an addressing system. The whole bunch of numbers, there's a domain name, there's a, you know, you, you have an address, and then you know uh, what domain, it might be Harvard, and then it might be EDU, which your education might be org, it might be government, and then, then there'll be a country. The only country which doesn't have its name at the end is the US, because of course we started it, and so on. And there has to be a body which assigns the names and the numbers. So ICANN became an outgrowth of, of in fact, that happening. And so who assigns the names and the numbers? And other countries now with the worldwide growth of the internet 
have some serious reservations because we control so much of it. Most of the servers are here, etc. And then the Russians want their piece, the Chinese want their piece, and the Indians will want their piece, and so will five other countries. So this is a big, big issue, how you assign those, those numbers and you interface with the thing. So we are in control, but people do not trust us anymore as, as much, and some of it is, a lot of it is the economic competition. The economic competition that came out in our, in our panel was a, is a very important element here. So how important do you think the, I'll call it the deck stacking, was uh, for companies that, have, that are now dominating the, the internet, like Google, like Amazon, yeah. Facebook? Yeah. You know, so emerging. I think this is, again, I'm a great fan of technology, uh, but today's New York Times is an article by Joe Nocera where he reviews a book where, in fact, the big internet companies have made a huge amount of money but the people who are doing some of the work are you and me. We are the individual little ones, but we're not getting reimbursed. We should be paid in micro dollars, which then amount to billions of dollars. Bitcoin. Right, 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 right. In a sense. So it's really, I would take Bitcoin for that. Right, right, right. So there you are. It's really, we, this has to evolve because we now have behemoths who are using some of the, yes, yeah, so, so that, whether that will cause us a problem long term is an open question, but that is stuff on for debate. So, so how do we make that uh, or, or help that evolution along? Obviously, there's uh, the, the incentives of, of the Googles of the world are to, are to not give up that, that yeah. control and that U.S.-centric view. Yes. Um, and you know, by its very nature, we're looking to make the internet uh, and cyberspace more um, valuable and usable for people around the world, so they can monetize yes. uh, the internet. Yeah. Obviously. The people who are the, the powers that be at Google and, and other U.S. centric organizations, whether it's government or corporations, they don't want to give that up. How do we actually incentivize that? How do we how do we move from where we are today to a more multilateral uh, governance framework? Yes. So I think this is an extremely important question. I, what I was very pleased with uh, uh, Fahad's uh, talk, he was trying to reach out and actually have diplomatic missions, so to speak, in Russia in China, in India, in Brazil, Brazil, Brazil a huge, yeah. huge case, et cetera, because we have to build that trust. And ultimately, our companies have to realize that they are now global companies. The populations which are going to grow are in China and India and Brazil and all of those other places. So they will, so I think this will evolve, and ultimately it has to become multi-stakeholder, mm -hmm. multilateral. So is it a matter of making, uh, making it clear to uh, Google and Amazon, it really, it's in your best interest yes. uh, to extend this to and the rest of the world because that's where a lot of your customers are going to come from. So I think over a period this will evolve, mm -hmm. and, and I think that hopefully uh, will reach some kind of an equilibrium. But there probably will be a lot of missteps along the way. We're facing the same thing actually with GPS. GPS is the most important invention, even almost as important as the Internet because you are able to tell location, etc. And it was also done by the U.S. Defense Department. And you know... We controlled all the GPS information. We've got all the satellites, and we've got all of the uh, stations in all over the globe, in Australia, to span the globe. Now, Chinese are setting up their own GPS, the Russians want, and the Indians, because they are afraid that they, and the U.S. does not give the full open because that So is Google. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and so this is, these are huge, huge issues, which will have to be, uh, in some senses, not that different with trade, as World Trade Organizations, and there will be competition, and then there will be have to be some uh, agreements, etc. So I think what ICANN is beginning to do to reach out is a good thing. Vicky, you, you, we were talking again off camera about the the notion of governance in, in, in cyberspace, and you made a comment that perhaps uh, more open source yes. is, is an approach yeah. that could be an effective governance mechanism. Yeah. I wonder if you could elaborate. Yeah, on that. I, I it's, you know, this is this is a matter of debate. It's again people who want to control versus people who want open. Because it is so distributed, its strength may only come by actually having it even more distributed. And in fact, that also provides some security because nobody can follow up the whole thing. There may be some minor perturbations somewhere. And so, uh, and I'm not an expert in the complex systems, but my intuition tells me that may be almost the only answer. Mm -hmm. Just because you can't control it that way. I wonder. Um I wonder, I don't know how closely you track, I was joking about Bitcoin before, but this notion of crypt, crypt, cryptocurrencies that emerged yeah. you know, by some smart guys with yeah. some servers, and, and, and essentially what is, appears to be an open source-like yeah. movement, which is tolerated yeah. by, for instance, China, but maybe warned against. Um, 
What do you make of that type of development for, for commerce, for currency? Um, and, and what do you think we can learn from that, if anything, in terms of uh, governing cyberspace? I don't know. I, I really am not an expert in that area, but clearly it is still to be resolved. Mm -hmm. And I, my, my own uh, view, again, is that there are creative people out there, and we should let those creative juices flow, and then ultimately the marketplace will decide it. Mm -hmm. The marketplace will decide it because, in fact, that's why I'm for that, for that openness. That's the beauty of it. It's built on openness and trust. Mm -hmm. And, and the way we lost out this year with the, with the Snowden thing, that we have compromised the trust we had with the food and our allies. And so all of these will, you know, this is, human relations are trust, your family is our trust, so. so that was a, maybe a risk-reward equation, yeah. but certainly we don't have all the information, yes, but, right. but, it, but it appears that yeah, you know, maybe the reward well, wasn't as right. great as the risk that I, I we actually mitigated. think yeah. security is important, yeah. but you still have to do it intelligently. Yeah. Right? You can't search the whole world. You're finding like a needle in a haystack. You've got to do it much more intelligently than, than say, we just got billions of data. Makes no sense. Well, we talk a lot, Jeff Kelly, about analytics and yeah. finding those needles sure. in a haystack. Sure. Um, so I wonder, you know, you, we talked off camera a little bit. We talked uh, here during the segment a little bit about the need to uh, for engineers to really understand how the world works yeah, yeah. and kind of the social consequences of some of the things that they're building and how they fit in the world. Yeah. Kind of a related question, I, I think, is how confident are you in, I guess, our world leaders uh, that they can transition us to this new, uh, through this cyber governance uh, question, um, do they have, do you think, the, the blend of technology no uh, knowledge and expertise with the policy expertise and political expertise. You, 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 in other you, words, do, do politicians understand technology enough to, to, to get us through this? Oh, you, I'm so glad you brought up that point. That was a point which came up in our mm -hmm. panel as well. We, now that I've spent four years in the Kennedy School, we have, it's really, really sad that we don't have people with enough knowledge of technology. The bigger problem, engineers should be more socially conscious, but the other is even more serious, mm -hmm. far more serious. You at least have to know who to go and ask the right questions. And if you see what problems we had with healthcare.gov, we didn't have a clue how to run this kind of system. We needed to have some really good technologists in there running the thing. And that's what Fahd said as well, as well as the Isaac. But we need to get many more people who understand that so that actually the right, at least technological knowledge will be there. So this is a huge issue. And actually, I'm, that's why I'm working passionate to get technology much more into the public policy. Well, Fadi told the story. He was in a, some meeting and Deutsche Telekom yeah. was proposing that we start, they start the, the, the German internet, exactly. and, and Angela Merkel was listening yeah. intently. Yeah. But so why, why shouldn't there be a, a German internet if you're, well, if it's, you're Merkel? it's back to the issue of, you know, this, uh, this issue of uh, uh, ICANN and multi-stakeholder. Yeah, if you can right. have one, yeah. why can't you, I well, have one? Same with the GPS systems, right. And this is, I think... But it's not the answer, is it? Is it or is it? Is it, it, it might have a be. German internet and a China internet? No. And but but you still have to figure out how you interface them. I think one of the things is... Protocols. Yeah, the so protocols, right. right. <laughs> I, in fact, I said that's a diplomatic thing, right, protocol. So I think uh, it, uh, it will evolve, but German companies are also global companies. Chinese companies are global companies, and therefore they will have to be able to work with each other. Mm -hmm. Even if you mm -hmm. design them, if you don't design them to work together, you're going to be dead. That's really the... Our ultimate hope is we can't go to war with China because we are so economically dependent on each other and vice versa. That's the deterrence. And well, there's another question around. Do we make it feel a little better? I think for the Chinese military, or the US military, we probably do need a Chinese internet and a, and a US internet. But that's a purely military function. Mm. But for all the commerce, the commerce I, I, though, right. I mean, you tell me, I mean, you look. I, no, I, supply yeah. chains. <laughs> supply I mean, chains, yeah. right. <laughs> right, exactly. Right, it seems to me it would be truly a step backwards exactly. if we started to so, wall this. Uh, yeah, my own view off. is that the main internet should be really an open internet. For certain very, very special things, you might need a Chinese internet, a U military internet, and so on. Uh, but okay. just not necessarily controlled by the strong hand of the U.S. government. Right, 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 right. But to Fadi's point, you can't just pull the plug on that. No, you there can't. There are legal issues, You're there right. are security right. issues. And the same thing, and the same issue with GPS, as I said, because really it's yeah, not yeah. Un unrelated. Because the GPS, the main thing the smartphone is so good for you is you are able to locate yourself. It's the question they ask you, are you willing to share your knowledge? Of Happily, if it benefits it, me. Right, right. right. <laughs> so, so it's huge, it's mm -hmm. huge, yeah. it's huge. So anyway. Well, uh, so, you know, as we're going forward and we're, and we're trying to, as a, as a 
world community trying to develop some of these governance capabilities. Uh, what are some of the risks that we're, we're, we're trying to govern uh, or, or guard ourselves against? Um, and how has that changed in your view from what uh, from the early days of the internet to what, what we see now? I mean, we see actors like, lone actors like Snowden, or we see people, uh, groups like Anonymous uh, coming, uh, coming to the fore and attacking both governments and corporations. You also got the physical infrastructure that is now on the grid. Uh, what are some of the threats specifically that we're talking about that it makes this question so important? Yeah, first of all, I think one big difference in security arena between, let's say, nuclear, which I know something about, where the threat is highly physical and huge and also concentrated. And the state is important, very hard. There are issues of nuclear terrorism, but usually it's gonna be Iran with a bunch of nuclear centrifuges, etc. But in, in the internet, there can be a very large number of non-state actors. It's so distributed. And that, of course, is, is the complication, right? And, 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 and it's just like having a criminals. We're going to have to, have to develop protocols and, and, and et cetera, and I try to understand that. Harvard recently had a student uh, do a bomb threat, mm -hmm. and then he did get caught. Right, to, to get out of finals. Uh, right, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> and, and so now the, the, really good sp uh, the really good thieves will not be as incompetent as my <laughs> Harvard student, <laughs> but eventually we need to, so, so, so that's, that's kind of what the NSA and others will be doing. So we just celebrated you know, the new year, and every year I look back and I say, okay, do I feel more secure than I did last year? I've done this about, probably for yeah. about a decade, and, and yeah. each year I, I come to the same conclusion. No, I, if anything, I feel less secure. So my question is, is given the prevalence of, of cyberspace, the, 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 the notion that uh, international relations haven't kept pace and are unable to keep pace, is security, in your view, a do-over. Do we need to rethink the way in which we approach security completely? Yes, I do think so. I think, at least my experience with TSA, you know, with aircraft. Right. Now, it's, in a sense, it's good we've not had too many aircraft, but we are not scanning people intelligently. Mm -hmm. I'm 74 years old. I have a knee with an artificial knee, and God knows do I get frisked, and, and so on. And you look at most of the terrorists, they're usually 19, 22 years old, 22 year old. You've got to use some common senses here, and we're just do, not doing this intelligently. And so this applies everywhere, and ultimately, what we all value is our freedoms. So there is this battle between security and freedom, and we may just have gone too far. I think it has to be rethought where we have to man, uh, balance the risk with the threat. Well, in addition to the threat, I mean, you, the, the power that the internet provides to, you know, potential criminals or terrorists also is the same power that uh, enables innovators. Right. Um, so you've got to somehow try to eliminate or reduce the threat from, from, from potential criminals and terrorists, but allow innovators to still leverage all that power of the, of the internet. Absolutely. When I met with General Alexander and he was heading the National you know, Cyber Command and so on, I said, NSA has to have the most creative computer scientists and attract them because that's the best defense. Mm -hmm. Because in fact, you want those creative people there and, and that really, and the reason they would want to work on national security problems because it'll be challenging, it'll be exciting. You want to do the most exciting problem and not some mundane military problem. I'm, there's a difference. I don't want to be, you know, crass. So. Becky, we were talking earlier about Bell Labs. Yeah. I mentioned Xerox Park. You've yeah. seen technological yeah. innovations over the, the decades. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to say, I, I as an observer have been just surprised at how much new innovation uh, uh, comes out. Uh, what has surprised you, um, and what are you tracking these days that excites you? So I think, uh, clearly, I'm a great believer in the, in, in the individual creativity and innovation, but people have maybe gone too much to the venture model, because Silicon Valley was obviously highly successful, but the computer area does not require huge amounts of investment, in the sense you can go to your little garage and do things, etc. But certain things require a lot of investment. And if you look at the case, one of the biggest problems of our time is energy. And if you look at our public utilities, we've got a 100-year-old electricity system. We do not, and we're going to have to get a new kind of Bell Labs, which can start tackle large problems, which require expenditures on a different scale, and that will become very important. So we need to create new kinds of Xerox and, 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 and Bell Labs and industrial labs who could address the big physical issues, 
We still want the venture capitalists to do their thing with Facebook, etc. But ultimately, even they are realizing that they need the physical infrastructure. Google bought Motorola. What do you call it? Microsoft has bought Skype and Nokia, and then it'll go down the chain. So this is an important element, and it's a national strategy. I feel we are falling behind as a nation. Well, this is a this is a great yeah. uh, talk, talk, talking you know yeah. track because. Yeah. There are you know, CEOs that we talk to on the Cube are very frustrated with the U.S. government. When I asked, I asked Joe Tucci recently, who was the CEO of EMC, what was it like in your trip to China? And he said, I'll tell you one thing, this is a problem that you and your grandchildren are going to have to deal with. When I'm in China, I get the sense that the government and, and, and industry are very much aligned, and, I, and, and CEOs are telling us that they're, they, they feel like they're not aligned in the U.S. They're almost fighting yeah, each right. other. So to your point, you've got to have that infrastructure. The government is the one who right. largely provides Absolutely. that infrastructure. It's key. Actually, it's kind of tragic. We, I go, I've now gone to China. They actually get it. Yeah. And they're supposed to be a communist country. They actually are using free market techniques and really getting the best. They're hungry. They're hungry. They're hungry. <laughs> we have suddenly have this outmoded view that somehow that it'll just be sorted itself out by, the, by competition. There really is a role for our leaders, including the industrial leaders and the government leaders, to actually articulate. But otherwise, China will be way ahead. Mm. We used to get it. Kennedy got it. Some of the others got it. Yeah, what for the big hard mean? problems, yeah. you yeah. have to have that yes. alignment. Yeah. Well, that alignment. And what is really important, it's this fight between Republicans and Democrats is horrible. Mm. And it's a marketplace to decide. The industry is not worried about the regulation. I've had enough. Industry wants firm benchmarks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you change the tax policy every day yeah. of the week, give me some certainty. Change certainty, yeah, and, and then and get yeah. out of the way. Yeah. So that really <laughs> is an important part of the element. And then also, the research part is not about science and engineering or science and technology, but what is it the long term? The government has to invest in the long term, the infrastructure, including the research infrastructure. And then the shorter term goes to the industry. Yeah, the but shorter term, to your, to your point about venture capital, right? right? Which is, which is you, yeah. know, you can argue, has helped the U.S. Absolutely. competitors of course. in the short term, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, yeah. But well, we'd like to go back to this. The, ch the challenge, it seems to me, currently, is to, to, to invest in infrastructure as a government. You've yeah. got to potentially raise taxes or, yeah. or divert funds from other parts of the government. Yeah. And we've obviously got a conversation or a, a situation in this country where we've got you know, the rise of kind of the Tea Party and the libertarian yeah, streak, which yeah. doesn't want to invest more in, right. in things like that. Right, and that's, you know, it's really, uh, I like to say, I do believe in the free market and, and individual creativity, but the reason Bell Labs worked was the following. You can have a thousand flowers bloom, you want a thousand flowers to bloom, but there, ha there are also 10,000 weeds. Somebody has to tell the weeds from the flowers, somebody has to kill the weeds and fertilize the flowers. And you've got to be able to do that. Mm. We're not doing that very well. Well, uh, so I'll, let me follow up on that. So, so who, who is that? Is that the government's role to do that, or is it the market's role to do that, or a combination? Some of it is the market's role, which happens in the later terms. That's what venture people do. But in the research end, you really need people of vision who actually understand the larger parts. They won't have perfect judgment, but they will actually where where you invest in people, not so much on projects. You say, Mr. Kelly is really a great person. I'm going to back him. You invest in people. Mm -hmm. That's much more important than the project. Well, I mean, what about what about the role of no, education? Lesson, I'm writing a book on it. What about the role of education? Obviously, you're in higher education, yeah. but starting younger. Oh, uh, yes. If, oh, that's really important. That's why we want uh, the technologists to be able to explain the excellence. That's the one advantage of the computer generation. Computer relates to society so well. We want to excite our kids. That's really important. And excite their imagination. They need to be the inventors. That's what America was about. And we, we, we are currently, I think the CEOs are correct. Mm. Chinese capitalism is encouraging the, the real excellence in, in the people in an odd way. And it just really, it burns me up to say that. Well, wow. now what do you tell, we've run out of time here, but yeah. what do you tell yes. young people that they come to you and say, oh, professor, you know, where should I go? What should I study? What should I get involved in? What's hot? Everybody wants to. You know, give me the give yeah. me the answer, and of course, most most people we ask that question just say, you know, follow what you love. So, yes, yes. Uh, so that's obviously yeah, yes. you know sort so, of table stakes. Yeah, 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 right. But what do you what do you advise young people that come to you? Well, I, I would advise two things. First of all, of course, you must be passionate about something. But when you're young, is the time to experiment, to explore. So you go and try different subjects, different. That's why liberal education is valuable. And then over a period of time, you say, this is what I really love. So 
really important part. When parents would come to me, my kid hasn't decided which field they want to get. I said, don't worry. That person is 19 years old. He's got time. Let him explore. This is the one time in life he or she can explore. And then over some period, they'll come to us. That's how it matters. OK? Becky, great to meet you. Thanks right. so much for time coming for some lunch. And, uh, okay. Congratulations <laughs> for uh, all your good work. Okay. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back. This is theCUBE. We're live from MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right back. <laughs>